Hello, and welcome to Resilience Radio, episode 22 on play, joyful movement, and aging. Today's episode is borrowed from a video cast of, from Amy LePage of Emerge, and is actually featuring me as the person being interviewed. So here you go. Welcome. This is Emerge with Amy LePage, and this is Conversations for Better Health and Well-Being. And today I am here with Irvin Eisenberg, a resilience OT, and we are going to be talking about resilience and play, joyful movement and aging. So Irvin, why don't you share a little bit more about yourself? So um, I'm, I own the business Resilience Occupational Therapy, and I've been an a structural integrator before becoming an occupational therapist. So structural integration is a deep tissue massage or body work modality. We're looking at posture and movement, um, a lot about fascia. Um, and then an occupational therapist is a, a master's degree that allows me to charge insurance companies for some of the work I do now. And it's, that's, it's a very holistic umbrella category occupation that sort of covers um, all the meaningful activities we do in our life. So insurance companies like to pigeonhole it pretty narrow, but the reality is it's a pretty, um, pretty inclusive for a, for a, for a degree program that's been around for a hundred years. It's a pretty inclusive, um, holistic <laughs> title. Yeah. That probably allows you, yeah. That like allows <laughs> you to cover a wide range of things. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And of course there's becomes like any, like any system, there becomes the things that they get pigeonholed as, but I, in my practice, really try to be, what can I offer to my clients and what I'm, without having to be pigeonholed as to what OT is supposed to be. Yeah, cool. Well, I love that because it kind of leads into what the theme of our conversation is today, like resilience, joyful movement, play, aging, which isn't necessarily a topic that gets talked about a lot. Um, so I, I, What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about those things and what's important to you around those things? Well, in, in OT school, we learned there's these seven different types of occupations. Um, we, have, we have our ADLs, which are our basic showering and our dressing and our ability to take care of ourselves, toileting and such. Um, yeah. And then we've got our instrumental activities of daily living, which are most of the other things we have to take care of in the sense of... Um, driving and cooking ourselves food and taking care of children and shopping and all of that fun things. Yeah. Um, and then there's your job, which is the, which is normally what we think of when we think of occupation. And then there is education. And then there is um, sleep and relaxation has now gotten its own category, which is a really neat topic in and of mm -hmm. itself. But then there's these two categories that are presented as separate categories. Mm -hmm. um, one is play and the other is leisure. Huh. And some people divide it as play is for children and spontaneous unplanned things. And leisure is the more sophisticated thing that adults should be participating in. Mm. Um, yeah, so I like to play poker sometimes. And me reading a rule book on poker or studying some of the numbers around that isn't play. It really is a leisure activity. I might not like every part of it. Yeah. I might not like every part of fishing, but um, I might not like actually putting the worm on the hook, but I do it as part of my fishing activity because it's a leisure activity. So it's not a spontaneous play. Yeah. Um, so I push back on the idea that sort of leisure is this sophisticated adult thing and play is this thing for children to learn and, and, and can be from a child standpoint can be gotten into much more. I'm not an, I'm not, primarily in a pediatric OT. So mm -hmm. I won't speak as much to that end of it, but I feel like there's so much value in play, spontaneous movement and joy in, mm -hmm. um, in movement for adults and activities. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. The first thing I'm kind of thinking about as, as you talk about those, this, those things and play, and I know that it is in my own experience, it's almost like as soon as the like real adult kind of life <laughs> started it's like oh there's all these responsibilities and all these things I have to do and like ch -ch -ch -ch, you know this and then throw if you have kids on top of that all of that that um I feel like I totally lost spontaneity in play and it was kind of like this foreign thing of how do I what I that's not for me like I have to be this responsible person so it's just really interesting that there's the mindset too that goes along with it and and how does that also impact one's ability to find that 
viscerally in their body, right? And to be able to attune back to that idea of play if the mind is in such a different place too. Yeah. 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 I'm thinking that like how often adults, um, you have your work time and then you have your alcohol time. You go to the bar and that's your, that's when you might become more spontaneous because you've literally removed inhibition, but you're also sedating yourself. Yeah. So like, so not to completely demonize alcohol, but it's clear, it, I feel like it's trying to fill something in our lives that mm. we're, we're not socially allowing for ourselves. Mm. Yeah, um, interesting. So I think about my work as a, when I work, look at fascia, the, yeah. so you got the, the material that's holding all of our muscles together and a fluid, resilient um, fascial system can look similar to that of like a child bouncing around mm. when a child falls that you that we all cringe because they fell on their knee or something but the reality is they might have scraped their knee but they're not likely to have injured themselves they kind of bounce they're so watery and mm. resilient um so often when i would go through like a structural integration series i heard someone describe that oh structural integration that's where you go through the whole series and you're like a child again and i was like no because we're not children <laughs> And I don't want, you see a child right. falls well, but they also don't, can't walk in a straight line a lot of the times and they're walking into things. Yeah. And there's something so ageist about the idea that we should be idealizing that the only joyful movements are those of children and are immature and mm -hmm. that we should, and that the whole term young at heart really bugs me. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> why, do, why do we have to be young to be able to be joyful and um, open up possibilities for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, an adult develops a set of sophisticated skills over time. We, um, if you talk to a young carpenter versus an old carpenter, the young right. carpenter might have more energy and 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 be willing to climb up higher on the ladder and do more risk taking things. And there's there are definitely some pluses to that. But the old carpenter um, can be so much more efficient and has really become a craftsperson. Mm -hmm. So we think of physicality peaking in its 20s often. And I'm like, well, maybe it peaks in its 50s or 60s, depending on what activity you're doing or even later. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. That's making me think about how when you were talking about the resilience and the fascia and like, you know, with my work, it's teaching people about how their body's built to move, moving well, and a lot of tuning in um, and listening and paying attention Um but within all that, there's also this other layer of how, you know, especially as we age, it's almost like the world and our bodies literally can like go like this with restriction, right? So the less we do an activity, the less we, you know, do something that moves our body in these different directions, it's like our body becomes more and more stiff, that whole thing. And then like the fascia, what you're working with, it's like, it's, it's lost its malleability, um, so just how important it is even physically for people to be able to keep movement happening in their bodies so that they then can feel like there's even a possibility of spontaneity or of play or doing the things that they love to do, you know? Yeah. And while you're doing that movement, if your movement is doing the nautical at the gym is a very set track and you're actually narrowing your movement patterns. Again, you're exercising and that's better than not exercising or you're that's a bigger debate, but <laughs> <laughs> you're moving and that's better than not moving, I'll say. Um, yes. <laughs> and so, but you're narrowing your possibilities. Yeah. And we have to, we have to, in order to refine something, we have to narrow it. I mean, when people talk about meditation, that is a fixed sort of that, that honing in on a particular yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. So there is sophistication in in meditation, in learning, in honing a skill, but it then limits our other possibilities. So it's this like winnowing down to develop real skill while still opening ourselves up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. I so, know. That, <laughs> so I find transition points for people is when they come to me. Mm. And that's when, like, if someone's in the middle of their thing and they're honing in their skill, I might be able to help them hone that skill a little bit. And there's things I can do to help them. But when they, when they're learning a new skill or they're bumping into something that they realize there's an obstacle because um, they've always been holding the hammer this way while um, while hammering, and now they're honing a new skill of of um, skiing. 
and mm. and they realize that they're having trouble skiing and they're they're really trying to master skiing and they realize that i might help them discover that their old pattern of holding their hammer this way um is actually interfering with the skiing yeah yeah but the yes but what i really like is those transition points when somebody often it's like either adolescence or um, perimenopausal or menopausal or postmenopausal or what does retirement mean or I'm switching new jobs mm -hmm. the old patterns which have suited me and are sophisticated and important may not be suiting me now mm -hmm. and to open that up we have to explore and kind of be playful yeah definitely and yeah those um those things that we've done before to either, you know, their habits and patterns that served us at certain times. So I'll definitely talk about that in terms of um, use patterns or things, right? Or the ways that a body might adjust to something, um, but that at some point it's like, yeah, an outgrowing of, or just there's something going on in the body where it's not working anymore, right? And so then new things are needed. And, and I think this idea of like the play, the spontaneity, um, it's almost also like, how how does one find that when it's not necessarily something that societally is um i don't know taught encouraged and like i'm thinking about how where i live you know there's this new mountain bike trail right and so it's something where like i see so many more people going and there's young kids and there's older people and i mean there's probably a definite age limit on that sport but but just this even that idea of like recreation, like what that idea of what what is there for adults that might even be that playful quality if it's like just an activity or a game or does it always mean exercise? Like, I don't know. You know, there's so many ways to look at it. Is it just being playful with your spontaneity and how you respond to somebody or like putting on music and having a one minute dance party in your kitchen? And that would feel awesome. You know, there's so many different ways, I think, that it could happen like bringing in that spontaneity again and also how do you do it when it's almost like not really encouraged to a certain degree you know yeah i mean i i think it definitely has its roots in sort of um new england puritan um, <laughs> it, because it's not it it is cultural not that it doesn't exist in other cultures for sure yeah. but it's this um i mean the concept that we worked our our nine to five job and that we're and that actually like leaving the build not eating lunch at your desk anymore is considered like yeah. <laughs> is you, you're almost being weak by by actually deciding to go for a walk or to um, mm -hmm. or or just go outside to eat for a moment you're you're kind of a weirdo in a lot of settings for doing that maybe less so in Vermont specifically but mm -hmm. but it's not part of that culture um, and I think about yeah the just how much we limit ourselves mm -hmm. so much and that that play and spontaneity is inspiration mm -hmm. it, it puts us in a position to view something differently yeah um, yeah it, like for yeah that got creativity is impossible when we can get into that place of something different yeah one of my one of my favorite shoulder exercises i so often get someone who comes in with a shoulder injury or and they go oh my shoulder hurts when i lift my arm up and i just I push through and i could give give a bunch of exercises to try to strengthen that shoulder and then give stretches but often the first thing i do is i say well if it hurts when you do that well why are you doing that well i need to get the can off the shelf i said okay then how else can we get the can off the shelf <laughs> um maybe once you get that point back off and go around mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that you have this playful you people who can't do this can often do this and get their yeah. arm up higher than yeah. they may have before. Mm -hmm. But when we get so linear in our, in like mm -hmm. bumping our head, head first into the problem versus dancing the problem. Mm. Yeah. That, yeah. Well, I love that dancing the problem. I love that you just said that. So, you know, here we are kind of getting close to the, the end of our conversation, but I wanted, I just feel like it'd be great to be like, all right, people listening. <laughs> you and I, what's something we can do today actually to bring in this idea of, well, what's something that's spontaneous, playful, and that just feels good movement wise, like really specifically movement wise. Um, so for me, I'm thinking about like, okay, I, I think I am going to like put on a little song after this and just go have a little 
dance party in my kitchen, my kids home remote learning today. So it's like, maybe he'll join me, maybe not, you know, what's something that you feel like you could do today to kind of bring this idea in. Hmm. I know well, the first thing, the, 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 fir the first thing that jumps to mind is not specific to today. Um, I remember unpacking in college and there's all these nervous people who are like, there's trying to create like their new social, their new selves and defining themselves and everyone's unpacking. And someone had a big sheet of bubble wrap. <laughs> and I just went, oh, can I have that? And they went, sure. And I laid it out in the hallway so that as each person entered the dorm building um, with their boxes, they stepped on bubble rock. And, started, <laughs> and then everyone started laughing. Like, how can, awesome. you, how can you take yourself so that seriously when you're stepping on bubble wrap? And I love that you said that, too, because it's like, yeah, movement. But sometimes we need another vehicle to get us into that movement. And if we can laugh, <laughs> right, like <laughs> that releases so much. Yeah. Yeah. And they went from carrying something into like <laughs> putting them in their box real quick and stomping. Yeah. Like, so yeah. so bringing in a bizarre movement. Um, one of my favorite ones is if you're going to go up a flight of stairs, if you feel like you can do it quickly, try to do it as quiet as you can. You're training your fascia. You can be like, I'm a cat or I'm a ninja going up the stairs. That's something that when I have a chance to, it adds a joyful balance to your um, to your movement and is actually training your Achilles tendon to be able to absorb the shock going up the stairs. That's awesome. <laughs> but I love your use of music for yours. That, yeah. That, that, that's an outside thing as well that's bringing in that movement for yourself. Yeah, yeah. Irvin, this has been great talking with you. How can people get in touch with you if they want to find out more about what you do? Um, you can check out, you can Google me pretty easily, Irvin Eisenberg, but um, Resilience um, VT, um, no, Resilience OT, sorry. Resil <laughs> if you put it in Resilience Vermont, you'll probably find me as well, but resilienceot.com, and you'll find information about um, my, my business there, the insurance and all that fun stuff. But right. you can also reach me at Irvin, I-R-V-I-N dot E-I-S-E-N-B-E-R-G at gmail.com. And Right. Yeah. All right. And if you want to find out more about me and the work I do, you can check it out at emergeyoga.net. And yeah, I have some Instagram pages at Emerge Childbirth and the Somatic Movement. Breath Awareness One is at LePage Amy. So thank you so much, Irvin. And I thank hope you. you have fun walking quietly up your stairs later today. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. This is fun. Great. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, you can leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice and subscribe and get a new episode with an interview every week. This is Resilience Radio. I hope you enjoyed.